what's the cost of being a disciple of Jesus? In our growth group, we've discussed this question in one form or another lots of times on recent occasions. And the answer varies from uh, nothing to everything. What do I mean by this? Well, it depends what you mean by cost. Uh, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus will tell us to weigh up or count the cost before embarking on following Jesus. And of course, when we do that, if we understand it right, we will find that any cost in this life is in fact nothing in comparison to the gain that's found in knowing and being with King Jesus for eternity. But we may also find that the cost between now and when we finally see Jesus for the first time face to face might in fact actually cost us everything. And for some people today, even today, that is literally everything. Now, if you want to grab uh, your Bible and turn to the verses that we had read to us a little bit earlier, Mark chapter 6, you'll probably find that really helpful. It may also be that you want to pause um, this talk at this moment and go to the church website and download the handout that goes with the talk. The verses are on there and also an outline that you can follow through. You might find that helpful. And can I also just uh, give a brief health warning to those with small children? Uh, obviously, the content of this story in Mark uh, 6 is difficult for little ones. Uh, towards the end, I'm going to give some stats about the situation for Christians uh, living in our world today. Now, this could lead to some difficult questions for some of our younger hearers, so please bear that in mind as you listen. So, Mark 6, verse 14 to 29, it reads as a kind of an interruption to the rest of the Gospel of Mark, really. In verse 12 and 13, the disciples have been sent out on mission uh, to serve as disciples. And immediately after the verses that we're looking at, in verse 30, they gather together again around Jesus and they report to him all that they have done and all that they have taught. And in the middle, we have this slightly strange and brutal story. Uh, it's not at first glance about Jesus, but about John the Baptist. So why is it here? Firstly, because John the Baptist is in and of him, his own right, a critical Bible figure. He is, if you like, uh, the link man, he's the, the bridge. He is uh, the last old covenant prophet and the first new covenant figure and prophet. To see how Jesus follows him is really, really important. Secondly, it seems that in Israel, as Mark writes, uh, there are some pretty big expectations of what God is doing, kind of swirling around in the background. Uh, many of these have been kicked off um, by the ministry of John the Baptist. Apart from uh, the very first verse of, of chapter 1, the next 13 verses of Mark's Gospel are about John the Baptist. He is a strange and confronting and an uncomfortable figure who has been having a very, very significant impact amongst the people Jesus had come to. And though John the Baptist famously lived in the desert, he is having a huge influence over the people, even in the capital, even in Jerusalem. Mark 1 verse 5 tells us the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. And thirdly, uh, because of that, John's presence is, if you like, reigniting deep, commonly held theological memories of the Old Testament prophets, especially people like Elijah, and for good reasons. Not only did those Old Testament prophets have very significant and turbulent relationships with the reigning king of the day, such as Elijah with his king Ahab, and equally um, his famous wife Jezebel, but the specific prophecies of the Old Testament seem to be fulfilled in him too. So the last words of the Old Testament in Malachi, that Elijah would come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And the prophet that Mark mentions in chapter 1 verse 2, Isaiah, speaking of a messenger who would come to prepare the way for the Lord. They point very, very clearly to the significance of John the Baptist, and he is having a profound impact. And fourthly, uh, this, uh, this idea is foreshadowed in the story of John's conception and his birth. 
Now we're not going to go into that now in any detail at all, other than to say Luke records some fascinating details. Now today is Pentecost Sunday. And so we remember too that John's father Zechariah was told that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, Luke 1, 15 to 17. So John has come. He has baptised many for repentance and the forgiveness of their sins. He's baptised Jesus, the one who John said was uh, he was not worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. And he has told the world that though John baptised with water, Jesus would baptise with the Holy Spirit. So, so when we get to Mark 6 verse 14, all of that is swirling around in the background, but both in Israel and also in the way Mark's written it in his account. Now, the disciples, as we saw last week, are out on mission sent by Jesus to preach repentance, to heal, to drive out demons. And Herod has heard about it. Herod was not officially king, but was thought of and, and lived as such, though he was under the firm hand of the Roman Empire. And in verse 14 to 16, um, they help us to see kind of in real time what is going on in Herod and in the people's minds at this time. And then verse 17 to 29, we will see, look back to show us why. So as the disciples go about their ministry, sharing the ministry of Jesus, Herod hears about it. Maybe he'd heard of Jesus already. Maybe the disciples wandered to the villages that were not too far away and he heard. Regardless, the news of Jesus is now not simply a feature, if you like, on the local news. It is now an issue of of national importance, featuring even in the palace itself, Herod knows. And what Herod hears is disturbing for him because it reminds him of something, or rather someone. The word on the street about Jesus was that he was the prophet Elijah, or that he was not Elijah, but another prophet like the greats of yesteryear, like Jeremiah or Isaiah or Micah or Malachi. And some saw such similarities between John and Jesus that uh, they thought Jesus was John returned from the dead and who now in his resurrected form had miraculous powers in addition to the sort of prophetic confrontational speeches and ability to convict people of sin that he had before. And of course it makes sense that the people who thought that hadn't known of Jesus during uh, the time that they knew of John's ministry when he was alive. And Herod, well, Herod fits into that category, that last category, for a very, very significant reason. Mark tells us, But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. To Herod, the fear is that Jesus is John the Baptist, come back to haunt him for taking his life so ruthlessly and in such a cowardly way. Now we will soon discover that in life Herod was fascinated with John the Baptist, threatened by him and terrified as well. And it appears after his death he still is. So in verse 17 to 19 we are told the story. It's a story of, of violence, of lust, of, of betrayal. It features a weak, powerful man, a strong, manipulative woman, and the untimely, horrific death of the good guy. Of course, it would fit well into many magazines or movies or box sets today. And in fact, it, it bears remarkable similarities to the story of King Ahab, Jezebel, and Elijah that we mentioned a little bit earlier. Why not have a look later on in 1 Kings chapter 19 to see how it resonates? And as we will tell this story, I want you to notice two things as we go through. Firstly, the different characteristics and personalities that sin and evil takes in its opposition to God in these verses. And secondly, that as we saw last week, and as we started with earlier, in this life, 
being a disciple of Jesus costs, sometimes even costing life itself. Now we've seen John's disciples in chapter 2 verse 18, but the last thing we heard of John himself was way back in chapter 1 verse 14 where it says this, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And now here we are told how. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. You can find that in verses 17 to verse 18. Herodias had been married to Herod's brother, Philip. Herod himself was married to the daughter of King Aretas IV, a kingdom not far to the east. But Herod wanted Herodias for himself. So he divorced his wife, which caused untold problems and war with King Aretas later on, and he married Herodias, whom it seems was actually his niece. So it is an adulterous and an incestuous relationship. And it smacks of weak yet ruthless uh, leadership in the character of Herod. And it is clearly condemned in God's word in the Old Testament. And so the prophet of God spoke from God to Herod and to Herodias, John, and they didn't like it. Now I'm sure they could justify their reasons for doing it. The muckiness of sin rarely likes to go out without being dressed up in some respectability to cover it up. And we see that in our own lives, don't we? When we want what we want, even if we know clearly, or even just have the sense that it might not be right, we cover it with justifications. You know, it's not that bad. What about all the other much worse things in the world? But God didn't really mean that for us today, surely. You know, the world is so different from when the Bible was written. And of course, when someone speaks up, then we have a person to aim our justifying grudge at, don't we? How dare they say that to me when they have this or that going on in their own lives? It's not ours to judge. Surely we should love one another and try to be a bit more understanding, we say. But John had it right, didn't he? He knew that what Herod and Herodias faced was not simply disregarding the words of a prophet, but disregarding the word of God. Now remember, John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And after him, Jesus preached, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. John's message was not just confrontational truth, it was the most loving thing he could have done as he led people to repentance and therefore to forgiveness of sins by God. Do you ever forget that you're a sinner? Now we know it in theory, of course, don't we? Of course I'm a sinner, we all are. But what about in practice? Could you name characteristics of yours which you need to repent from? So John is in prison, but it's worse than that. Verse 20 tells us, So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. Like Jezebel before her, Herodias wanted the prophet dead. Now no doubt she saw not just a husband at stake, but the husband. Status, luxury, power. And all the while, John the Baptist was around reminding people of the illegitimacy of their relationship. That's what was at stake. So Herod wouldn't do it. She was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Herod knows enough. He has enough religion in him to know that John is righteous and holy, and that what he says is, is fascinating, is intriguing. And he liked listening to John. He genuinely enjoyed it, but his religion was anything but heart or life-changing. It led to fear 
not faith, even superstition. And that fear locked Herod into a no-win situation. To prevent the bigger evil of killing John, he did the smaller evil of locking him up. But everyone knows you can't protect yourself from evil by carrying out evil. The only way you can protect yourself is by turning to what is good and right and true. But, but he couldn't go there. Not and still have what he wanted anyway. So we have Herod's response to the truth of God being fear, fascination, and faithlessness. And meanwhile, Herodias is to hold a grudge, manipulation, and eventually murder. So Herod gave a great banquet for his birthday and invited all his officials and commanders. He also invited the leading men from Galilee, the civic and community leaders. No, no doubt they knew about John the Baptist and by now probably Jesus and his disciples too. Herodias' daughter provides the entertainment. Uh, they invite her in to dance, uh, the sort of dance which the text thankfully gives us no detail, you can imagine. But we do know she pleased Herod and she pleased the guests too. And as a show of Herod's supposed power and beneficence, customary known to be expressed without any real expectation, he says, I'll give you anything, anything up to half my kingdom. Of course, the irony is um, Herod couldn't do that anyway because he only had what he had on behalf of the Roman Empire. He had nothing to give her, but it probably made him feel good and look powerful to his guests. And at this point, it seems the girl didn't really know what to say, so she runs to her mum, to Herodias. And now whether this was Herodias's plan in the first place or not, she wasn't gonna miss the opportunity. She tells her daughter what she wants, and so the girl returns to the king. Now, of course, Herod has no idea what's going on, and this tension is written into the story by Mark. In her response, the last three words she speaks are to name her victim. And we're told she, she rushes back to the king, perhaps bowing her head and then lifting her eyes to him as she says, I want you to at once give me on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Boom. When let loose, sin has its way. And then the passage tells us, and sorry was the king. He's been caught in the trap from which there is no pain-free way out. He could say no, but he has a reputation to look after. He offered her anything. Was he just bluffing? All his military leaders and officials and the leaders from the whole of Galilee are present. How will he lead them and expect them to do his bidding if he doesn't follow through? He could repent and release John the Baptist, but that too would look like weakness, wouldn't it? So he does the easiest thing. He concedes. And the rest of the story is like dominoes. He gives the order to bring John's head and the executioner goes and does his work and brings it on a plate. It's given to the girl who in the penultimate scene of this violent and brutal story passes the plate with a head on it to her mother. And we are left wondering how far sin and evil has allowed this manipulative, powerful and yet ultimately weak family to fall. As we imagine the look on her face as she gets her heart's desire, John's lifeless head on a plate. The point is shockingly clear. In this world, God's people who live for God's truth will often not be welcomed. Faithful living will ruffle feathers and get people's backs up, and on occasions, under the wrong circumstances, lead to ruthless results. So. North Korean Christians are considered hostile elements to be eradicated today. If discovered, they are either taken to a labour camp or killed immediately, and their families to the fourth generation.
generation face the same fate. Yet, realistic estimates suggest there are up to 300,000 believers in North Korea today. In Afghanistan, to convert to a faith outside Islam is tantamount to treason because it's seen as a betrayal of family, of tribe, of country. And very often, there is only one possible outcome for exposed Christians, death. In Afghanistan, converts are considered literally insane to leave Islam. In Nigeria, Christians are being killed by Fulani extremists today. 11 Christians are killed every day for their decision to follow Jesus. It's today. Now the last verse, verse 29 of our verses, reminds us of the context. Mark finishes this section and, and takes us to the return of the disciples by saying, when his disciples heard of it, that's John's disciples, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The cost to be a disciple of Jesus can be very great. Reflecting on how Mark records this story, in the middle of the disciples being sent out on mission and then returning from mission, one writer puts it like this. The sandwich structure draws mission and martyrdom, discipleship and death into an inseparable relationship. This is precisely what Jesus will teach in chapter 8 verse 34. There as here, both words are addressed to disciples. Whoever would follow Jesus must first reckon with the fate of John. John's martyrdom not only prefigures Jesus' death, but it also prefigures the death of anyone who would follow him. This story that kind of interrupts Mark's record of Jesus' ministry reminds us of the varying personality of sin that leads away from repentance and from forgiveness. It can look manipulative, powerful, in charge, or fearful, even intrigued or enjoying listening to the religious stories. But ultimately, it is utterly fruitless. And we need to examine our hearts and pray that God would be gracious to us in enabling us to hear the truth about our lives and our sin in all its blunt, confronting horror. And then we need to receive the life-giving grace and message of Jesus that offers complete and whole forgiveness, the message those disciples were taking out right at that time. We need to count the cost. And I encourage you, when you've counted the cost, to then throw yourself on Jesus. As Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Thanks for listening.